So what we're seeing in this matriarch circle is that we are strong, we're caring, and the violence won't continue. A newly formed matriarch circle is set up to help guide the Manitoba government as it creates policy and law when it comes to Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. So it's really being able to remove that barrier between the Indigenous youth and these companies. And helping guide Indigenous youth on their future career path. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The federal government is giving $15 million to Indigenous governments and organizations in the Northwest Territories in order to help with the effects of the 2023 wildfire season. The money will be used to reimburse governments and organizations for expenses incurred while supporting their members. Wildfires last summer caused 70% of the territory's population to be temporarily evacuated. Officials say many Indigenous governments and organizations use their own funds to help evacuees with flights, accommodations and cultural supports. The federal government says it's working with its Indigenous partners to ensure resources are in place for future emergencies. Residents of Yellowknife will also get to share their thoughts on the city's response to last year's wildfires. The city is holding a public engagement session tonight. We'll have more for you on that on the APTN News. Now to BC, where a desperate search is underway to find two women who've gone missing from the same small town. APTN's Tina House has that story. March 15, 2023 was the last time anyone seen or heard from Shelley Supernant's 29-year-old daughter, Darylin Supernant. Her last sighting was when she left her mother's house in Dawson Creek, a small town in northeast BC. And ironically, on December 2, 2023, Darylin's first cousin, 40-year-old Renee Didier Supernant, also went missing from Dawson Creek, BC. Renee was last seen at the Lone Star Nightlife Bar. She is a mother of two. Shelly is in Vancouver along with her husband Everett looking for them. I've been driving up and down these streets as much as I can look at people on the street to see if possibly she might be here. Renee, um, yeah, desperately wanting my daughter and Renee to come home. I, I don't know what to think, where she is, what so many things been going through my mind. You name it, it's gone through. Good, bad, scary. I look at vans differently, roads, ditches, everything. Everything is different light with no light at the same time. And so the same routine for many family members of missing people begins putting up posters and asking anyone if they have seen their family members. How are you? Have you seen my daughter or my niece? My daughter Daryl has been missing over a year now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then my niece has been missing. Do you think you remember her? Oh, I do. I know I remember. Oh, okay. Where did you um, see them? I just, I Which just, one? This one, that picture right there. This one here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for Shelly, any tip she gets, she shares with RCMP. Today, they are joined by members of the Butterflies and Spirit Dance Group, who devote their time in helping families like Shelly's. Lorelai Williams has some advice on how police can do an even better job. They do need a separate team, just to be searching with the families every day. When the families come, we'll search with them morning, day, or night. We're, sometimes I'm out in the middle of the night with them, but as long as you're with them, You'll get the tips. You'll get certain people that will talk to you and definitely not to be in uniform. And for Shelly and her husband, they're still clinging on to hope both women will return safely, but it's taken a huge toll on them. I love you both. Please come home. Everybody misses you like you wouldn't believe. I'm beside myself. I don't know what to think some days. Some days I don't even want to wake up, just keep sleeping. Yeah, I just, please come home. 
BRCMP have recently contacted Shelley to collect DNA, and she was reassured that both cases are still active, open investigations. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Daryl and Supernant or Renee Didier Supernant, you are asked to call the RCMP. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. In Manitoba, a matriarch circle has been formed by the provincial government, comprised of people with experience in justice, health and social services. Members will provide their expertise on how best to protect Indigenous women, girls and gender diverse people from violence. Matriarchs are an important part of our families, our communities and our nations. The group of 18 members will help inform and guide the Manitoba government on policies and laws regarding missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people, while also focusing on gender-based violence in the province. Uh, uh, Families Minister Nahani Fontaine says the goal of the circle is to prevent more people from going missing or being murdered. She says the circle has representatives from every Indigenous nation and geographic location in Manitoba. Actor and former politician Tina Keeper is one of the matriarchs. So what we're seeing in this matriarch circle is that we are strong, we're caring, and that violence won't continue. And that we also want to share with Canada our values of strength, commitment, equity for women, the understanding that women are at the centre, we are the decision makers, and that we honour that with ceremony and with our actions. The man convicted for the murder of anime Pictou Aquash wants to come back to Canada. John Graham was extradited to the United States in 2007 and convicted for the 1975 murder of Aquash. Her body was discovered on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota in February 1976. Aquash was 30 years old when she was murdered, suspected of being an FBI informant. Graham is serving a life sentence in a prison in South Dakota, but is currently seeking a transfer back to Canada where he can serve the rest of his life sentence. Aquash's daughter, Denise Pictou Maloney, joins us now for more on this. Denise, uh, thanks so much for, for taking some time today. Uh, I know a special day for you. Um, what is your reaction to John Graham seeking a treaty transfer to return to Canada? And what do you think the consequences might be? Um, well, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, this continuous cycle of of re-traumatization that our family has had to experience over the last 20 plus years. Um, you know, for someone that is so incensed on coming home, um, it, 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 there's important facts and information that's left out of the story. You know, our, our family was served with two injunctions when we tried to bring my mother home by John Graham's defense committee. Once when we repatriated her and again, when we tried to re-intern her a couple months later. So, you know, the significance of him asking to come home, um, you know, it, it, hits, it hits really hard for us because we never got the opportunity. It would have been nice for us to bring her home and to have that, you know, uh, that opportunity to lay her to rest um, without that interruption or without that um, trauma. Do you feel that there has been any justice for the murder of your mother? You know, initially in the first days when we had sentences um, handed down and, and, you know, we went through the trials and they were pretty fresh because it wasn't just his trial. There were four, four trials that we went through um, with 23 eyewitness accounts of, of his actions every step of the way from her kidnapping to him tying her hands and then putting him in her in the back of his car and driving her to um, Rapid City from um, Colorado, from Denver, Colorado. Um, I would say no, not when your family is constantly having to revisit the cycle of opportunities that he has had in exhausting every um, process to defend his, his um, accountability. You know, he has um, used American and Canadian system, justice systems to find technicality and uh, to free himself. And he had 20 years to speak his truth. Um, 
you know, his claims about um, a court shift in that article, you know, information that's left out of that story is that he disenfranchised himself. He denounced himself as an Indigenous man, so he didn't have to go through federal court. And then he was charged with state court as a non-Indigenous man. And that is the time that he's serving for felony murder. Um, you know, he's 25 years to live his life, to grow his family, to live free, while, you know, the lies that he and his counterparts part participated in in hiding the actual facts that it was American Indian Movement members that murdered my mother, um, you know, it, it really hits hard for us. It just It's just reopening wounds again. Um, it's a reminder of how families of MMIWG and 2S individuals in this country are not centered and valued. He's had a whole team of lawyers defending his rights for the last 20 years. Our family has, has been on our own defenses and our own devices to um, write those letters for advocacy and for support. And we've written hundreds of letters over the last 49 years to ask for help and support in what happened to my mom. Denise, you've been touching on it here, but I guess, you know, how has this impacted your life over these many decades? Well, you know, I think the biggest impact for us is, you know, his actions have impacted my constitutional, natural, and your rights to have my culture and my language, to be able to share that onto the next generations. That has impacted Annie Mae's grandchildren. You know, they don't, and I say they, meaning those that bring harm uh, on, on our women, don't acknowledge the the abrupt uh, interruption that that creates in our matrilineal right to, to, to move forward and to continue on in this universe undisturbed. Denise, we'll uh, leave it there, but again, uh, like I said, important day for you. Appreciate uh, you joining us on it. Thank you. It, it is her birthday. It would have been her 79th birthday today. So, Bulalan. To the opioid crisis now and in Manitoba, it's taking a toll on outreach workers. With a lack of resources available and one worker dying of a drug overdose last weekend. It's like fighting a war with a water pistol. We're, we're fighting a bigger war and we're still trying to do it with a water pistol. We have no resources to work with here. Shared Health says the province has 90 detox beds that can accommodate around 525 people each year. But last year alone, the province saw more than 5,700 emergency room visits due to drug overdoses and nearly 450 drug-related deaths. Manitoba's Addictions Minister says the province is working on solutions, including opening a supervised consumption site and adding more beds, but says more needs to be done to address a complicated crisis. Time now for a quick break. Still to come, a look at how Rebecca Strong fared on Canada's Got Talent last night. I feel like Indigenous people come together so beautifully. Welcome back. Last night, a young Indigenous woman from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, brought her voice to the Te Canada's Got Talent show. Rebecca Strong won the golden buzzer and punched her ticket to the next round of the competition. Our reporter Rachel May spoke with Rebecca about her big win. Rebecca Strong has been singing since she was five. Last night, her determination paid off. Since winning the golden buzzer last night, she's been swarmed with positive messages. I feel like Indigenous people come together so beautifully. Strong has been following the auditions for Canada's Got Talent, and she's excited to see all of the competitors. If I'm being really honest, I don't see this as a competition. I see it as a bunch of people um, showcasing their talent and if a person wins then that's amazing on them. Not only did she guarantee a spot in the next stage of the show, she won $25,000. But Strong says she's not going out of her way to spend it. Helping my parents out, I love, I love them so much. 
and I really think I'm just going to save the money. Canada's Got Talent airs every Tuesday until the finale on May 14th, where the million dollar winner will be named. Oh Rachel God. May, APTN National News, Saskatoon. Congrats, Rebecca. That's awesome stuff. What a voice. So you're going to be having a lot of eyeballs on that show in the coming weeks. The Spark Indigenous Careers Conference is now underway in Edmonton, and hundreds of Indigenous youth from across Alberta are in the city to attend. The three-day event is designed for Indigenous youth ages 16 to 30 and introduces them to educational institutions, possible employers, businesses, and political leaders. It all wraps up tomorrow with over 64 post-secondary and employer exhibitors, four keynote speakers. The event offers an opportunity for youth to learn about future career options and talk directly with people working in various fields. Natasha Delaney is one of the event coordinators. So the purpose of SPARK is to help to remove barriers and provide opportunities for Indigenous youth that are interested in working within the trade, STEM, public service and health industries. So it's really being able to remove that barrier between the Indigenous youth and these companies. There's so many opportunities that are available and there's so many organizations that are really wanting to help support and provide these amazing opportunities to them. A First Nations man is walking across Australia on his own to raise money for literacy. That story and more coming up after the break. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Allison Holmes captured this image of ice-covered rocks along the shoreline of Lake Huron. Beautifully formed ice formations there. Thanks for sharing, Allison. Share your pictures from across Turtle Island. Send your photos to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 10 in Halifax, 9 in Fredericton. Plus three with snow for Kuduak, one below and snow in Nain. Eight above for Montreal, snow and plus three in Valdor. Plus one with snow for Sault Ste. Marie and North Bay. Minus three and more snow in Thunder Bay, five below with flurries in Sioux Lookout. Minus 10 and cloudy in Churchill, cloud and minus three for God's Lake. Plus one and sunny for Winnipeg and Dauphin. Over in Saskatchewan, six above in Regina, plus three for Saskatoon. Zero in Meadow Lake, snow and minus five in Buffalo Narrows. A snowy day across northern Alberta, minus two in high level, minus seven for Fort Chip. Minus one with flurries in Edmonton, cloudy and eight above in Lethbridge. Eleven for Vancouver, fourteen in Kamloops. Five in Prince George, seven and snow in Smithers. Minus six with snow in Old Crow, plus six in Whitehorse. Minus four in Yellowknife, three below in Norman Wells. Minus 21 in Saks Harbor, 16 below in Politak. Minus 12 for Chesterfield in Whale Cove, 11 below in Arviette. Minus 25 in Resolute, 28 below and snow in Joe Haven. Imagine walking across Australia on your own with everything you need to survive in a handcart. That's what a 22-year-old First Nations man is doing to raise money for the Indigenous Literacy Foundation. Kieran Cox caught up with him as he took his first steps on an epic transcontinental journey. Proud Waramai man Bailey Myers is embarking on the journey of a lifetime walking from the west coast to the east coast. I'll be walking from Perth to Newcastle over the next five to seven months starting from today. I'll be touching the water along the coast here at North Mooloo Beach in Perth and then I'll be making my way back. It will be approximately over 5,000 kilometres and I'll be doing it walking alone with my trusty cart here. His cart is decorated with the handprints of Indigenous students from his old school. 
and he hopes to add more along the way. It has taken months of work to build the cut, which is fitted with everything to survive on the road. Starting his journey in Perth, he'll be trekking his way to Kalgoorlie, across the Nullarbor Plain into South Australia and up into Queensland, where he will conclude the trip in his hometown of Newcastle in New South Wales. His aim, to fundraise $20,000 for the Indigenous Literacy Foundation. The Indigenous Literacy Foundation just does incredible work through elevating our Indigenous youth, through uh, education, through connection to culture, and every single dollar just does such an important, essential work within those local Indigenous communities. And so I would really implore everyone to donate where they can. $5 can mean so much. Supporting Indigenous literacy one step at a time. Karen Cox, NITV News. Quite the trek. I'd take a walk across Australia next winter. Getting science out of the lab and onto the streets is the focus of a vibrant festival in Minjin, Brisbane. It brings together science and the arts with First Nations innovators sharing their journey. The World Science Festival is a chance to share knowledge and encourage the next generation. And our mob are front and centre. There's becoming a more of a, an awakening of realisation about how important we are as First Nations people to lead in this global change. From the striking ghost nest installation, from the world-renowned Pomparau Art and Culture Centre, to educational talks and exhibits. Mob sharing their knowledge and love of country. Because we were also the first horticulturalists of this continent. Um, so we understood the plant, plant species, we understood how to work with vegetation communities. Um, we actually dictated our occupation um, and our cultural materials or uses were determined by vegetation. The turtle exhibit, proving to be a popular stop on the festival as visitors can experience baby turtles hatching from eggs and learn about their unique lives. Some of these turtles in Morton Bay, some of the loggerheads, will crawl up on Morton Island to nest, while others will travel a thousand kilometres from their feeding grounds to their nesting beach. It's quite extraordinary. These animals are really quite remarkable. These loggerhead turtle hatchlings to be released into their natural habitat next week. We'll be taking the rest up on Monday morning and on Tuesday morning we'll go out to sea and we'll place the hatchlings directly into the Eastern Australian Current, which is where young loggerheads disperse from. The festival, now in its ninth year in Brisbane, runs through to Sunday. Dan Rennie, NITV News. Tough to beat viz of baby turtles. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Wednesday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca, or head on over to our APTN News YouTube page. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGwitch. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you back here tomorrow for your Friday Junior Newscast.